Hey there, and welcome to Gleaning the Scriptures. In today's video, we're going to be going over a very important point. There's been a false doctrine uh, going around, and it bases itself on the question of, well, if you had to save a life, then would you lie? Well, let's explore if that doctrine is something that should be looked at, that should be considered. Maybe it's not false. Maybe we should be telling a lie if we have to save a life. Maybe we shouldn't. I'm coming from you from my vehicle today. Things are a little bit different. Sorry, I'm not in my nice studio, but I hope that you are ready to learn with us today. Let's get started. Today we're going to focus on one of the commands, and this command is going to help us to see what being God really is. You got to keep in mind that Satan's focus is taking God's place, and one of the ways that he is working towards doing that is by getting us to behave in such a way that does that, that takes God's place. Another thing we're going to focus on is not giving you a fish, but teaching you how to fish. We're going to be giving you a Bible study tool in this particular video that is incredibly powerful. That Bible study tool is taking a foundation that's in the Word and then using that foundation to build a building in the right direction with straight walls and a sound roof. There's this thing called the Law of First Appearances, or the Law of First Mention in the Bible. It happens when a Hebrew word first comes up in its root form. The context clues around that word, they will describe the foundation of what that word actually means. Not in the world's terms, but in God's terms. And there is almost always a very slight difference between what the world sees as a definition of a word, what the church sees as a definition of the word, and what God sees as the semantics of a word. Now, this might seem a bit tangential to you, but it's not. There's a perfect parallel here in, um, in what we're about to learn and using the first things that come up in Bible as a foundation, in the Bible that come up as a foundation to teach us things later in the Bible as things get more complicated. Now, this command that we're focusing on is, Do not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness, false testimony. But what happens if you're in a circumstance where somebody's life is at stake, and you've been backed into a corner, and the only way to save that person's life is to tell a lie? My friends, the commands... God's commands, Yeshua's commands. He that knows my commands and keeps them, it's him who loves me. He will be loved to the Father, and I will, I will reveal to that person who I am. It does not say, he who cherishes life and holds dearly to life and protects the lives of those around them, it's him who loves me, and he will be loved to the Father, and I will reveal that person, reveal to that person who I am. Cherishing life is important, but it's not at the top of the hierarchy. The very top is keeping his commands. So if it says, uh, thou shall not bear false testimony, and then you have to tell a lie in order to save a life, then you have to tell the truth and that person must perish. Maybe God will perform a miracle, but your, your role is, is to be obedient to God. Obedience to God is his love language. And it doesn't matter if someone's about to die or not. It's not your responsibility to save that person if it means going against God's rules that he has given you. Now, I'm aware that there are several arguments here, several arguments um, that go to the tune of, well, what about in this circumstance when this person told a lie and it turned out good for them? 
That, those are strong arguments, and I'm glad that people bring those up because they're an amazing teaching tool. But I assure you the moral of the lesson that are in those circumstances is not, it's okay to lie. That would be a contradiction. And the Bible doesn't contradict, contradict itself. It's all truth. Instead, the moral is generally something more along the lines of when you are in your worst, when anybody is at just the bottom of the barrel at their worst, they still have a chance at a relationship with God. They're not going to miraculously turn into a person that's so full of integrity that they can do no wrong because they've given their life to the Lord. That's not how it works. Our Father is full of patience and mercy. Those things are part of his love, along with judgment and hellfire. Those two things work together to grow us and teach us how to be in community with one another in fellowship with the creator of the universe. One of these examples is the example of Rahab. Rahab was a harlot. Rahab was a harlot living in a nation that God had orchestrated it such that that nation had to be destroyed in order for Israel to gain possession of the promised land. That's a nation full of sin. So this was a nation full of sinners, and this sinner was living there. Not only was she in this nation of sinners, but she was a harlot, a lying harlot at that. And she used the version of being clever and witty and wise that she knew to help the spies. Why did she help the spies? Because the fear of the Lord had gotten into those people. Now, in this circumstance, there's a scale of the fear of the Lord, and we're talking about actually, like, being afraid, which, you know, if you don't know God and you are stuck in sin, you should be afraid of God because he's just. But there's another side of the scale that we'll get to in a moment. Rahab was on this other, like, afraid of God side of the scale, but it's still on that scale of fearing the Lord, and because of that fear of the Lord, she chose not to do what the world wanted her to do, but to do her best to save the spies. And it turned out for good for her. Why? Not because lying is good, but because God is merciful. Another example of this is when the two Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, remember these ladies? When they were asked of, when Pharaoh asked them, hey, you guys need to kill all the males and let the females live. They went out and they didn't do that. And Pharaoh brought them back. Pharaoh himself brought these ladies back to him and said, Hey, what are you doing not killing the males like we said? And they said, Well, these women, they, they give birth so quickly that we don't have time to get to them. And it says that the Lord dealt favorably with them and gave them Shipra and Pua households. So here we have a common thread. We have the choice to fear Pharaoh or the choice to fear the Lord. These women, these women being of the nation of Israel, the, the actual fleshly seed, not just spiritual, but both fleshly and spiritual seed of Abraham, of Israel. These women were on the scale of fear of the Lord that leaned towards a healthy respect in knowing what their heritage was, that kind of fear of the Lord. And in that fear, they chose to um, they chose to lie. They chose to say what they said, and God dealt favorably with them. Now, these women were not in the promised land. These women were in Egypt, basically Egyptians that had an understanding of their heritage, which was something from days gone by. Egypt was full of sin and magic. Egypt is a byword because it's known as being a nation that was founded upon sin. And these women, they were slaves of those people. Slaves of slaves, I tell you. Egypt was a slave to sin. These women were part of a nation that was enslaved to Egypt. Bottom of the barrel, the smallest nematode in the swamp. We're talking about real far away from Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. Salvation from what? Salvation from sin. That's what the gospel is, my friends. Salvation from sin. If you continue to sin and say you know the Father, then you're a liar. Look, 
these women were not near God. They just had a knowledge of him. They did the best they could with what they had. They were weak. They were sinners. They were not wise. They were not witty. They did not have strength. If Yeshua was in that same circumstance, would he have lied to Pharaoh? No, he would not have. He would have found a way to tell the truth and get the job done and trust in God. And God would not have left him high and dry in that circumstance because of Yeshua's righteousness, his character, his Zedeka. These women were not there. God showed his mercy to those women. He didn't deal well with them because lying is okay in some circumstances. He dealt well with them because they feared God. And he was ready to begin strengthening them and showing them how to reflect him better. He overlooks these things in some circumstances. If several years down the road, Moses had decided that in some witty repartee against a criminal, he would lie to the criminal to try to pull the truth out of him. Do you think God would have been pleased with Moses? <laughs> it's laughable. It's laughable because we all know that lying is bad. What about when the, what about when you're praying, when you're praying to God and you ask him a tough question, would God lie to you because he's afraid that you're going to throw some kind of a temper tantrum? <laughs> no, God can't lie. My friends, we are to be images of God. Now, all of this about Shipra and Pua if what they said was even a lie. It could be such that the Lord orchestrated events in such a way to where the women did give birth quick, more quickly than they could get, than Shipper and Pua could get to the pregnant woman. That's not out of the question here. It may be that they told the truth, and it might be that they just, you know, because of the circumstances, didn't uh, rush all quickly to these women to grab these babies that are shooting out left and right really quick to build up the strength of Israel. I'm not saying that's what happened. All I'm saying is that it could be what happened. One way or the other, God did not favor them because of a lie. And there is one last thing to look at here in terms of truth. This is a bit of changing gears here. There are several more examples of people doing things in the Bible that are not going with the Torah, with the law, yet God favors them. It doesn't mean that it's okay to break the law. It means that God's being merciful. The tool there, if you missed it, the tool that I just used to show you this, which is I'm using it because God has shown it to me and now I'm showing it to you, is that you start with the beginning, the command. And then you build and you manipulate the way that your mind thinks. You renew your mind. You make adjustments to the way that you think, not based on what you want or what you feel or what the world is saying, but based on the commands. The commands are the framework, and the rest of it is built upon that. Now, in terms of truth and how to handle it, there's two different ways to handle truth in two different circumstances. The one circumstance is if you are in the right. If you are in the right, you do not have to tell the whole truth. Okay? It is right and true and good for a just person to handle the truth properly when surrounded by the enemy. Even when surrounded by friends. If a just person is surrounded by friends... Those friends are in the same relationship with the Father as they are, and they don't need to vomit out every detail of the truth. You just put breadcrumbs. You spread breadcrumbs out on the water, and you let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Now, if you're a criminal, you need to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. You need to fess up, or if you've been caught, you need to tell the whole truth. My friends... In the latter days, they will call what is good evil, and they will call what is evil good. When you know the truth, you are not evil. You do not owe it to the enemy to divulge 
information. You are like a high ranking officer in the military and your responsibility is not to give information that compromises the war that you are in, right? So our American system of courts has put this tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God into the court system. And so it should be there. However, that does not apply when you are just in God's eyes. Now, this isn't just coming out of nowhere. This is coming from scripture. Proverbs says that it's the glory of God to divulge all the information. Now, that seems like what it would say, right? But that's not what it says. It says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To conceal a matter. To hide something. You see, hiding isn't just for witty, clever criminals. The reason it feels good to hide things is because it's part of our nature to hide the truth perfectly. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the honor of kings to seek out that matter. Does a king divulge all the information he knows to all the people around him? He does not. The reason he's king is because he holds information properly. You are a nation of kings and priests, my friends. And you will hold information properly or you will not receive it. Or you'll have false or sots information that leads you to the wrong picture of God. And we don't want that for you. It says that uh, in Psalms, it says, I will open my mouth in riddles and dark sayings. Dark sayings, that sounds evil, doesn't it? It does sound evil, and he used that word on purpose because it seems evil, but they will call what is evil good, and they will call what is good evil. I will open my mouth. He's talking about himself. He's saying, this is in Psalms, prophesying of the Messiah coming. I will open my mouth in riddles and dark sayings, concealing a matter. When God came to the Israelites, he came to them hidden behind a cloud. When he showed himself to Moses, he hid Moses and walked past him, allowing him only to see his backside, hiding his true nature. When Moses came down, his face shone and he had to hide it behind a veil. My friends, part of receiving the truth is learning how to handle it properly. You do not have to hand the truth over to the enemy. That is why we have fellowship. Fellowship with one another is built upon faith and trust in the word. And I'll tell you one more really important thing here. The Bible is incomplete. Now, those of you who read the extra biblical texts, text Bill and the Dragon and, you know, all that ridiculous stuff, those are fables, cleverly devised fables, just like Paul warned, do not be led astray by cleverly devised fables. None of us, my friends, are being led astray by Zeus or any other of those things. Those are not cleverly devised fables. They don't trick us. The things that trick some of our loved ones are the extra biblical texts. So what do I mean by the 66 book canon? The Bible is not complete. What I mean by that is if you just read the words on the paper and just leave it at that, you're not getting the whole story. What makes the word complete is reading the text that's on the paper and coupling that with the Holy Spirit interpreting it within you and time. Study yourselves approved, my friends. And time. That Holy Spirit, that's what Yeshua referred to when he says, I must leave you so that you can have the helper. The helper helps with many, many things. And one of those things is the proper interpretation of the word. That will fill you in on what's happening in the fellowship of the saints. Thank you for growing with us today, and shalom.
Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you click that subscribe button, that helps the channel out a lot. So does liking the video and making comments. I am interested in what you guys have to say about what you just learned or if you feel that what I taught was out of place. Be respectful, but the comment section is open for you. Also, my main talent really is writing, and you'll find that in the description of this video, and if it's missing there, that you can go to www.gleaningthescriptures.com, and there's a link there to the WordPress site where just about weekly articles are written that dive more deeply into these lessons. Thank you so much for being here and watching to the end of the video. Tell your family and friends and be blessed today. I pray for you guys, and I know that you can grow your faith just as abundantly as the Lord wishes for you to. Go ahead. Click one of those videos, what are you waiting for? There's more learning to be had. Grow your relationship with the Lord. Sort out your salvation in fear and trembling. Amen.